Thank you for joining us for worship. I'd like to begin with some announcements. The personnel committee would normally host a listening session at their next meeting, but since we can't meet in person, they are offering you the chance to express your thoughts about the church staff by emailing Jeannie Osterhout. Jeannie's email address is listed in the bulletin as well as the church directory. Also a reminder that during next Sunday's service on the 17th, we will be honoring all of our Sunday school teachers, our nursery room volunteers, as well as any recent graduates. Zoom meetings scheduled for this week are a double header on Tuesday as parish life and personnel both meet at 7 o'clock p.m. There's also an all-church Zoom get-together on Thursday night at 7.30 p.m. This is our third one, I believe. They tend to be a lot of fun. Again, you can call into a Zoom meeting. You don't need a computer with a microphone and a video camera. Uh, so you can just contact me and ask me how to call in. Or for the all-church Zoom get-together, you could ask uh, Becky or Jewel. Another announcement, um, I have been doing some Bible readings and reflections on our Facebook pages. These are intended for all ages, hopefully, um, and I am posting new videos on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Sunday, because that seems like a manageable pace. We're going through the New Testament in the order the books were written, and so we've started with and we've already finished 1 Thessalonians, and now the second book, chronologically written for the New Testament, is Galatians. And that's what we just started. Welcome to worship at whatever time or in whatever place you have joined us. God gathers us together in spirit, calls us together as a people, even when we are spread out in time and space. And we come together to share in the experience of God. In the midst of all this stress and change, I invite you to ask God for the peace that surpasses our understanding. And as we seek peace, and as we make peace, let us worship God together. Please join me in the call to worship, printed in your bulletins, taken from Psalm 31. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. And I invite you to join in our first hymn, God is Here. We will sing verses 1, 2, and 4.
Please join me in the prayer of confession printed in our bulletins. Forgive us, Lord, for we still stumble over your chosen ones. We treat them as obstacles on our march to freedom or safety or certainty. Remind us that if we do not look for your face in the low, the cast out, and the forgotten, we will not see it. And now join me in a time of silent prayer. Those who trust in God will renew their strength. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not grow faint. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. first reading from scripture is once again from Acts, but it's uh, jumping ahead about five chapters from where we were last time. And it goes to the story of the martyrdom of Stephen. And so this is Acts 7, verses 55 through 60. And uh, as before, it is printed in your bulletin. But filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears, and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, Receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our second scripture reading continues in 1 Peter, and we're now in chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, come to him a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, But now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, may we be a people shaped into a dwelling place for you. May we be a people shaped by the mercy that we have experienced so that we in turn offer that mercy to ourselves and to others. Amen. So as I said, uh, the readings today are continuing on in 1 Peter, pretty much directly after our previous readings. And in Acts, we are jumping ahead to Acts 7, where we kind of leap all the way into the martyrdom of Stephen. And as you read about Stephen being stoned, and Saul appears, which is interesting, uh, we know we're going to see him again in this story, you might be wondering, like, what got them so angry that they were willing to stone Stephen because for the lectionary reading, they skipped that part. And so if you go back uh, a couple verses in Acts, this is what Stephen was saying. And you can kind of tell that um, maybe he knew that he had already crossed a line with them, uh, but he kind of tries to shout them into repentance. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did you not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that received the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. And so that goes about as well as you would expect with the crowd he was speaking to um, and was perhaps the last straw for him. It was certainly the last straw for them. And yet Stephen, even as he is being killed, martyred is the kinder way to put it perhaps, he reflects Jesus. He says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit in the same way that Jesus said on the cross, into your hands I commend my spirit. And just as he is dying, he says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Just as Jesus said when he was dying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And so Stephen wasn't able to maintain Jesus' patience and quiet 
as he was facing death. Um, But at the end, to the very end, he reflected Jesus in how he lived and in how he died. Paul was also there, currently known as the young man named Saul. And the witnesses laid their coats at his feet. Uh, This is kind of like putting your cloaks out on the path in front of Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem. This is just a way of honoring Saul, kind of giving him credit for what was happening. Because at this stage in Acts, Saul is still uh, a hunter and persecutor of Christians. And so as Stephen is beaten to death with thrown rocks, I wonder if this image stuck with the young Saul. I wonder how he felt about it years later uh, as we read his letters to communities he founded following the same Jesus that Stephen did. But in this story, we have a clear example of Stephen as a stone that the builders violently refused. The image I want to take from 1 Peter is this image of the stone that the builders refused has become the chief cornerstone. Or in Hebrew, it actually isn't precisely clear. The Hebrew word for this stone is that it's a place in an angle. So it could be a cornerstone. You kind of picture at the base of a corner in a wall. It could also be a capstone in an arch or a doorway. You know how the stones in an arch kind of curve in? And then there's a capstone that bears the weight of all those stones and holds everything together. And if you pull out that capstone, everything would collapse. And so the stones that the builders refused becomes the chief cornerstone or the chief capstone. And in rabbinic stories describing this passage, which comes up in Psalm 118, that's the passage that uh, Jesus quotes in Matthew and that Peter quotes here. In rabbinic reflection on that passage, they tell a story. So long ago, when the Temple of Solomon was being built, which was, as you may know or recall, it was the first temple to be built in Jerusalem. So when the Temple of Solomon was being built, it was still an active worship center used every day. And it would be annoying to have the sounds of construction and stone cutting while you were trying to engage in worship. Like, if people were doing construction right next to the church right now, it'd be very difficult to preach and to concentrate, right? It was the same case in this situation. And so we read in 1 Kings that the stones to be used in the temple were cut elsewhere. And they were cut according to the plan. The builders had plans in mind. They knew uh, the dimensions of every stone they had to cut. And so they would cut them at the quarry, and then they would carry them, uh, ship them all the way to the temple, and then place them according to the plan. So what happened was, apparently, is that the stonecutters cut the the capstone of the Holy of Holies early. It was one of the first stones they cut out of, like, the purest and best stone. And so they sent along this capstone, and if you've ever seen one, it looks like a trapezoid. It's just a weird shape. And so the builders got this weird-shaped stone in amongst all the nice rectangles they were going to use. And they were like, I don't know what this is for. Maybe they made a mistake. And they set that stone aside because they were working on the walls and the foundation. They weren't to the capstone yet. And as the story goes, as years progress, because the temple took years to build, as years progress, like, the capstone gets overgrown with weeds. In some versions of the story, it kind of rolls down into the garbage pit. Because people just didn't know what the stone was for. It looked like an error. And so later on, when they have the, the gate to the Holy of Holies built up, and all the weight is resting on scaffolding, they need the capstone to put in so they can take the scaffolding out, and it won't collapse. And then one of the builders remembers, hey, you guys, you remember that weird-looking stone that we tossed out like 15 or 20 years ago? Let's go find that thing. And so they go digging in the grass and the dirt or in the midden heap, and they find the capstone that they had rejected. And they take it over and they put it in its place, take out the scaffolding, and now the Holy of Holies, the center of the temple, 
is complete and everything holds up. In other reflections, they look at this idea of the stone the builders refused becoming the chief cornerstone or the capstone as a reflection of David. Because, of course, all the Psalms are attributed to David. Whether he wrote them or had them written for his court, we know that historically that's where they come from, the court of David and some from the court of Solomon. Maybe some are adapted from previous songs. Maybe some are original. So it's a Psalm of David, 118, And David was the stone that the builders rejected. His father, Jesse, if you recall, when looking for who would be anointed king, brought out seven of his eight sons, all the the tall, uh, muscular, older sons, and each one was rejected. And then he was asked, don't you have an eighth son? And he was like, oh yeah, there's David the goofball. He plays his harp. He follows around the sheep. He's out in the field somewhere. Like, bring David. So they brought David, and David was anointed king. Another case of the stone the, builders, the builder rejected becoming the cornerstone. Other examples in Jewish commentaries are Joseph, rejected by his brothers, uh, tossed into a well, sold into slavery in Egypt, who becomes the core leader who rescues the Hebrew people from starvation. Or the slavery itself, that the, that the Jews spent time in bondage in Egypt only to be freed and to become God's people, the cornerstone of God's plan for salvation for the whole world. Elijah was at one point the only living prophet left. Nobody liked him. Nobody wanted to listen to him. They had killed all of the other prophets of Yahweh except him. And he ends up being the one to face off against 450 prophets of Baal, and to basically single-handedly, as the story goes, bring back worship of Yahweh over and against Baal. So this is a very consistent theme in both the Hebrew Scriptures and in the New Testament, basically cover to cover. The consistent theme is that God chooses rejects. That is what God does. God chooses rejects. When you line up to pick teams in, uh, in, in gym class, God picks last. God picks last. A smart God would have chosen Greece. That was an amazing empire. It ranged from Spain to India. A smart God would pick Rome, the Roman Empire. It was right there. Jesus could have been a Roman. A smart God would pick Babylon or Persia, these massive ancient empires that stretched for thousands of square miles and hundreds of years. Heck, a reasonably smart God could have picked the Phoenicians or the Canaanites. They had way more influence in Judea than the Jews did. But no, the stones that are rejected become the ones that are built into a house for God. So we, living in the United States, are not like the rejected stone that becomes the cornerstone. We are much more like Rome or Persia. We are the superpower neighbor that can push everyone else out of the way and get our agenda handled first. And we can choose to ignore almost everyone else on earth if we want to, or at least we feel that way. And so where do we find cornerstones on which to build? Where do we look where God is looking? We look, of course, among those we refuse. We look among those we reject and deny and marginalize. And after six years, it's not going to shock you, the various groups of people that I would bring up as people to have in mind as we look for these cornerstones out in the world. These people at the edges that I think God calls us to bring into the center. One example I would lift up right now is uh, Latino and Latina migrants who have come over the border and who work as farm workers right now in the fields. 
Because they're in a very interesting position because they are both described as illegal and essential. They are simultaneously illegal and essential. And so people seek them out to arrest them. And also we all go hungry if they didn't work. Ponder that. Illegal and essential. But during COVID-19, during this pandemic period, there are new people who are being pushed to the edges or who were near the edges before and are being pushed farther out. Because this is an unprecedented time. And so there are new people being pulled into the center, and there are new people being pushed outward and rejected. I think it's more clear than it ever has been that the internet is a utility. It's like electricity. It's like water. Uh, Because not having reliable access to the internet means you cannot join us for worship, you cannot go to school, you cannot get a job right now or look for a job, you can't speak to your family and your friends and seeing their face, you can't see the faces of people you love. People with health issues, usually invisible at the best of times, are going to be even less visible now. Like when we talk about reopening, when we talk about gathering back together and returning back to normal, there's a big chunk of people who will not be there with us. And those are people who have existing health conditions, chronic health conditions that make them more vulnerable to the coronavirus than average. And those people, even when we all say it's back to normal, the economy is open, all the restaurants are open, Disney opens, Those people will still not be here because they are at greater risk than the rest of us and they will become even more invisible because if you talk about opening and gathering and return to normal, they will just be excluded. There are, of course, other people who are already in poverty who will be driven into deeper poverty. To be able to work from home is a privilege. And if you have the kind of job you have in poverty, you can't work from home. Those aren't jobs you can do from home. People of color are already being impacted by the coronavirus far more than than white people are. And this is compounding issues that already existed. Refugee camps, already difficult places to live, are currently genuinely frightening. Because you have the most vulnerable people on earth numbering in the millions, and social distancing is impossible. And quality health care wasn't available before. So if we imagine these people can have hand sanitizer and masks and be six feet apart, that's just not going to be the case. The same thing with people in jail and in prison. I was talking to a friend yesterday who's a lawyer, and he's saying the courts in his area are only now opening. But courts are not prepared for this situation at all. And so they are barely able to get through a few cases in their docket each day. Meanwhile, if you're charged with a crime and you can't afford bail, you're just in jail until your court date. So you're locked in a jail with thousands of other people at close quarters with very little health care, very little sanitation, no protective gear at all. And so not only are new people being pushed to the margins, but the people who are already near the margins are being pushed maybe all the way over the edge. And this is upsetting. And I'm not sharing this primarily to upset you. I think that if we're people of conscience, we're already upset about some or all of these things. None of us are unmoved by what's going on. I share these things with you so that you know where to look for the cornerstones. So that you know where God is gathering stones in order to build a house. Paul watched as Stephen was martyred, literally beaten to death with rocks. And all the witnesses who were there piled their cloaks around Paul to celebrate the part that he played 
in killing this person. But God's kingdom is always built by the rejected stones. And we as God's people must not stumble during this time. We cannot trip over these stones, but rather we have to look to the edges. We have to look to the margins, to who is rejected, to who is abandoned, to who is left out. Because in those places, we find our calling and we find our home. Amen. I now invite you to join in singing deep in the shadows of the past, and we'll be singing all four verses. reminder, I'd like to once again express my appreciation for all the support that people have uh, shown for the congregation, all the generosity uh, through PayPal and also through direct deposit uh, from banks and through the mail. Um, so we're very thankful for that. I also want to remind everyone that uh, we are 
we are eagerly inviting you to share your needs with us for use of our COVID-19 support fund. Um, so please uh, don't hesitate to let us know when needs arise because this pandemic is going to affect all of us in different ways that are hard to predict. I also wanna have a note of thanks for the generous supporters of that fund. Um, one giver shared their family motto, which is to whom much is given, much is expected. And you guys always seem to give more than is expected. And it has been uh, moving to see the response. And we now have resources to help people as needs come up. I'd like to now uh, go to a time of prayer. This is the time in the service when we gather in prayer with and for one another. Um, not only the few of us here, but also uh, those of you watching. We gather in spirit, sharing our joys and our concerns, and any other prayers that may not fit those categories so well. And so please join me in a time of prayer. Loving God, we thank you that even when we cannot be present with one another, in the midst of all the stress and all the pain that that causes, that you continue to be present with each of us and to draw us together and make of us a people, to build us into a house where you can dwell, even when we are scattered. This morning we join with those who are celebrating Mother's Day. We give thanks for mothers, for women who serve as mentors, and for all the women who have shaped us and who have made us who we are. We celebrate Celia graduating on the 9th with her Master's in Speech and Language Pathology. We celebrate Jen, who has found full-time summer work. And we continue in prayer with Doug as he enters into final interviews on Wednesday and Thursday. We also lift up in prayer those who are pained on Mother's Day. Because there are some for whom this is a very hard day, perhaps a hard reminder. And so we pray your presence with them as well. We ask for traveling mercies as Celia's family moves her back home to Cleveland. We continue in prayer for Sue's sister-in-law, Polly, as doctors are still seeking the source of the cancer. She is home, uh, but she continues to be weak in her struggle. Lord, we lift up all these prayers that have been shared aloud. And we join together sharing the prayers we hold in our hearts. We lift up all these prayers in the name of your Son, who in turn is the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I invite you to join in our closing hymn, O Christ, the Great Foundation, found on page 7 of our bulletins.
peace. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And love yourselves, your neighbors, and your enemies. Amen.